Um, when you guys were almost uh, at your end point, you went back into the cutting room, correct? Um, this was around the time of the Kavanaugh well, nomination. Um, we went back in when um, Kennedy retired. Yes. Um, and Annie and I, we, we had finished the film. We were what's called color correcting it and sound mixing it, and it was done. <laughs> and then <laughs> to Netflix's credit, we got a phone call from... Lisa uh, on a Saturday, and she was like, Lisa no. Nishimura. And Lisa yeah. Nishimura, and said, you know, call me back when you can. And we were like, uh, we better call her back right away. And she said she wanted to us to consider uh, making it as up-to-date as possible to really make it this moment that we're faced with where we are today. Mm -hmm. And so we, they, they afforded us that opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, good decision, because I mean, it really takes you right up to the moment. and. I think that you had said that you had um, argued the, the one case that where Kavanaugh had ruled on um, yeah. in the area of abortion. Yeah, so I uh, am litigating a case right now. It's still ongoing, but I argued the only abortion case that Judge Kavanaugh heard when he was on still on the, the Court of Appeals in D.C., and it involves uh, an unaccompanied immigrant minor who came to the United States. Uh, she had been abused by her parents. Uh, was put in a shelter run by the government, and she discovered she was pregnant, and she requested an abortion, and the Trump administration refused to let her out of the shelter uh, to access abortion. They just told the shelter she was prohibited from leaving, from having abortion. Uh, a ban on abortion that is so explicit and something that we don't often see. Uh, so we had an emergency case that we ran into court. We got an emergency order from the district court judge in D.C. We, uh, the government appealed it to the Court of Appeals and Judge Kavanaugh was on the panel. And he issued a ruling uh, in a two to one d uh, decision saying that the Trump administration could have more time uh, to find a sponsor, which is a family member that uh, the young woman could be released to so she could have the abortion outside of government custody, effectively continuing to allow the Trump administration to block her from accessing an abortion um, for what could have been weeks. Uh, we sought an emergency uh, reversal of his decision and luckily got it and she was able to get the abortion but it was um, four weeks that she was effectively held hostage pushed further into her pregnancy before she could get the abortion and uh, we got a, a broader victory for class action of uh, pregnant unaccompanied minors and uh, now I'll be arguing an appeal next week in the Court of Appeals on the the class action piece of it to prevent any this from happening again. The frightening thing is it kind of pushed it right up against the boundary of what Texas statute is. Yeah, so she was um, about 15 weeks when she finally got the abortion, and Texas bans abortions at 20 weeks. And um, this was a big discussion that I had with Kavanaugh during the argument. And uh, so knowing full well that that was the limit, um, he nevertheless issued a decision that continued to block uh, her abortion decision. Hmm. I'm wondering if you could all just um, address what the film makes so apparent, which is the incredible discipline of the pro-life movement over so many decades around this issue and how they've gotten it to just, you know, really um, galvanize the Republican Party. So, absolutely. That's, they are very persistent and they are very strategic. Uh, and they pay attention to uh, who's running for office and who votes. Um, and the reality is in America today, state legislatures and state legislative races, either the House or Senate in most states, are won by very, very few number of votes. You know, a typical House district in, say, Pennsylvania, where I'm from, can be won with 12,000 votes. And so if you have an organized constituency that is willing to work really hard, uh, in state and local races, you can take over states very quickly. That's what happened in 2010, uh, which uh, when the Democrats really ignored the states, they took over uh, over 30 states by winning both the, the gubernatorial races and the House and Senate. Uh, and then they strategically passed laws that redistricted a gerrymandered district so that Congress becomes more anti-abortion, uh, and they have limited voting rights to make it much more, much more difficult for 
those who are pro-choice to win again. So I think they've been very strategic in all of those things. Uh, and the important part is it doesn't take a lot of people. It just takes enough people who are incredibly uh, organized and who are willing to take a stand. Uh, because the reality is America is a pro-choice nation. Uh, we, the, the numbers are with us, but the people who vote are not, and that's what's so important today. We have to remember that our power in legislation really lies with who votes, who comes out to vote, who comes out to protest, who comes out to make a difference. Um, has this film been seen by people on both sides of the issue? Yeah, I mean, the film premiered at the Telluride Film Festival over Labor Day, and we were, we wrote to everybody who participated and also who we interviewed for the film, even if they weren't in the final cut, and many of those people are pro-life. And we choose the term, we've talked about this before, pro-life, because that's how they self-label. Many people on the, on the reproductive justice side choose to say anti-abortion, and many journalists do as well. But so the pro-life groups that we spoke with, um, they all wrote back and said, we're you know, very excited to see the film, we're very supportive, we're ha going to be happy to help you push it out. The, we haven't heard much since it's opened, but we also haven't heard, I mean, it was interesting, Texas Right to Life tweeted a promotional thing about the film when it opened. So that's John Sego, who's the young man who you see. Um, you know, we've had a few emails asking us, I mean, I'll be very frank, I think that people are curious. I think um, the one email that we did receive from a woman who was not in the film, she was very specific in her asking about why we chose not to show an actual abortion in the film. And that was something that we discussed, and it was, um, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing. We earned the trust of women who participated in the process, and it's, that's just one more thing that's a difficult ask of a woman. Any questions? Yes. One second, here comes a microphone. I was just curious, uh, have the pro-lifers done anything regarding the children that are born that wind up in orphanages or to poverty women who cannot support them or educate them properly. I mean, it's one thing to say you can't abort them, but then it's another thing, to, who's gonna take care of them and how are they gonna get along in life after? Right, I mean, that's definitely something that we were up against in, in trying to narrow the focus of this film and we really tried to keep it focused through the prism of the Roe v. Wade decision, but there's so many issues that abortion brings up, whether it's contraception and why, if you really are against abortion, you might pr you know, support um, better health, uh, sex education and contraception and making it more affordable. But we try not to, we, we didn't get into that, but yes, I would say like Sam Lee, who's in the film, who's the Missouri um, uh, Campaign for Life, his wife runs a halfway house for women who are pregnant, but oftentimes, and um, they, the women do, once they have the baby and they get sort of a little bit of support for a couple months, they really are on their own. So to answer your question, we haven't seen, we, we, we really did not see a comprehensive program for women who get pregnant to maybe get their education or to help with childcare that is sustained. Yeah. And the irony that we talked about, and unfortunately we had a longer cut where we addressed some of it, but right, we talked about Title X funding, which came in under President Nixon, which was basically at a time when there was big emphasis on global population, and Title X provides federal funding for both family planning, contraception, um, education about sexual health, and it is money that goes to both what are called crisis pregnancy centers as well as Planned Parenthood. It's basically if you're providing services that help people with family planning. But it came at a time when there was real concern about what is the cost to the government of supporting women who are unable to take care of children. It's, it's a funny switch now where we are. You see in the back. Yeah, yeah, right there. No, further back and then we'll get to you after. Uh, here comes the microphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry, it's coming. Yeah, you. Yes, you. Person there we go. <laughs> so I have a question because there's a lawyer on the panel. Um, so in, so I'm Muslim. In Islam, uh, life begins after three months of the pregnancy. Um, but in, apparently in evangelicalism, life begins at contraception, at like conception. when it, conception. So conception. Um, would that be against the establishment clause to say that you are favoring a certain religion's views of when life starts 
over another. We have a lawyer on a panel, so I'm really yes. interested in asking this legal question. Two so lawyers. Two, two, two lawyers. lawyers. Yes. Ooh, two. Three? Yes. So the Establishment <laughs> Clause argument that you just made, that is adopting one view about when life begins, uh, was made in a case called McCray versus Harris, uh, was the challenge to the cutoff of Medicaid funding for abortion. The Supreme Court declined to actually address the question, finding instead that uh, the person who brought the case didn't have standing. Uh, and that argument has not been made since that time. Uh, it is my view that this current court would never uh, go that way, um, even though there is a, a fairly good or at least interesting legal argument uh, to, to say that. Yeah. I think the important part, though, in all of this is that religion really differs uh, from religion to religion about both when life begins and the appropriateness of abortion. And the interesting part of, of what the anti-abortion movement has done is they have made religion synonymous with being pro-life, when in fact most mainstream religions are pro-choice, uh, and Judaism is pro-choice, and Islam is pro-choice up until three months of, you know, the first three months. So every religion is different, and I think that the appropriation of religion to one side of this debate has been a, a very, very problematic development, uh, because when we started working on this issue, uh, religion really divided, and there were strong religious views on the pro-choice side as well. Uh, and I'll just add to that, and maybe it wasn't, I, don't, I can't remember if it was Harris or there, Bowen, but there was another uh, Supreme Court case that talks about when the government's position just happens to coincide with uh, a Christian point of view, then there's no establishment clause violation. Like there's, there's just, it just happens to be that the government is taking the same p position as a particular religious view, which is different than uh, the government you know, using its dollars to pay for proselytizing or something like that. So there's a distinction that, that is made in some of the cases. Uh, but, you know, it's certainly a line of question that I have for Scott Lloyd, who is the Trump um, appointee for the Office of Refugee Resettlement, who ordered the shelter that the young woman Jade Doe is staying at um, to uh, to prevent her from leaving. Um, he is extremely anti-abortion because of his religious beliefs, and I have lots of questions and have asked him lots of questions at his deposition about how he's using his own personal religious beliefs um, to develop policy that blocks people from having abortions. And I think that there is an argument there that that crosses the line um, uh, into the Establishment Clause. Yes. Yes. Here comes the microphone. Yeah, right there. Uh, I think. One sec, one sec. Yeah. Um, first of all, I wanted to say I thought it was an amazing film. And thank you to the two directors for really spelling that out. I feel like I have lived through so much of that. Um, you know, working at the ACLU um, for the justice and being on the board of Planned Parenthood, but to have it clearly spelled out over the years was just wonderful. Um, I also want to direct my question to the lawyers on the panel. Um, are there any cases out there right now that come close to squarely presenting Roe versus Wade that are on their way to the Supreme Court? And is there, should Kavanaugh be confirmed? I hope that doesn't happen, but should Kavanaugh be confirmed? Will there be a rethinking of litigation strategy going forward? Yes, I think, um, you know, as, and, as Kitty can attest to, any current litigation that is pending that is challenging one of the many restrictions on abortion in this country could very well be a vehicle for overturning Roe, even if it's not an explicit ban on abortion. You don't need uh, the, a state to pass a ban on abortion for the direct question to be presented about whether Roe should be overturned or gutted. Uh, you know, it's not just that Roe could be overturned, but, you know, as, as, as you've seen from Kitty's case, that the weakening of the standard for review of abortion restrictions makes all the difference in terms of what restrictions are upheld by the courts and therefore are the obstacles for women seeking abortions to the point where many women just can't get abortions. Um, so there are a host of those abortion restrictions working their way through the courts and are, are on their way. And then I think um, come January when the legislatures come back in, we're gonna see outright bans as well. So l let me be really clear here. 
the Kavanaugh uh, nomination uh, is, in my view, you know, should he be confirmed? And I actually still, unless women rise up really strongly between now and next week, uh, believe that he will be the fifth vote to overturn Roe. And when I say that, I mean he will change the standard of review either from the undue burden standard to a more, even more permissive standard, uh, which is often referred to as the rational basis test. Um, he may not say, I hereby overrule Roe versus Wade, but he will give states more and more and more latitude to uh, not only enact restrictions, but I actually think uh, to criminalize abortion in certain circumstances. Um, and that is very, very problematic. Now, why do I say that? Uh, two reasons. One, you know, uh, Bridget's case and, and how he ruled there. But more importantly, he has said repeatedly that Justice Rehnquist is his hero. The way that Justice Rehnquist decided uh, Roe and um, the way that Justice Rehnquist has approached this issue throughout his career, that is Kavanaugh's model. And what I uh, try to remind people about was in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, there was an, a, an opinion written that overruled Roe. Who wrote it? Justice Rehnquist. And what he did is he said, we are returning this issue to the states. Uh, we are giving them great latitude as long as it's rational, which he meant as long as it promoted fetal life, then they could do anything they wanted. And that opinion was never uh, actually entered into the court because uh, Justice Kennedy changed his mind. He was on it originally, and then a couple of weeks later, he changed his mind and, and wrote the Casey decision. Uh, but we know what Rehnquist would have done, and I am 100% of the belief that Kavanaugh would do the same. Yes, this lady right here. One, wait for the microphone, please. It's on its way. One of the things that does not seem to come up... Um, one of the things that does not seem to come up, and this is following through with what the gentleman said you, over, they, over there, is a study on the children who are born and brought up by parents or a woman who does not want to have a child. If there was a study done, is what is the consequence to the mother, her education, her ability to take care of the child, what happens to the child in terms of mental health and also to the family and the community and the cost to society in terms of mental health? And I think that since you can't, that this is such an enormous divide be between who believes and who doesn't, but if there were a study done and you have the consequences of that, then you, you're, not, you're dealing with reality, not with emotion, not with religion, and not with people's personal beliefs. So let me just say, there's been hundreds of studies. There there's been thousands of studies. We know the consequence of criminalizing abortion, and we know the consequence to women who are denied the ability and to their children. This is about power. This is not about rational facts. And until we understand that this is about power and that we demand that we have that power again at the political level, we're not gonna make change on this issue. And I would love to believe that great arguments make change. They don't, okay? I, you know, I have a personal stake in this. I wanna believe my great argument in the Supreme Court made change. No, it didn't. What made change were Americans standing up in public arenas, on the streets of Washington, D.C., in the state legislatures, and demanding that their views on choice be respected and that women are valuable and have something to contribute to this society. This is about power, and we need to remember that and exercise our power if we're going to make change on this. What, yes? Yeah, I'm just kind of curious. It's, a, it's more of a film question. Um, with the exception of Wendy Davis and, the, uh, and what you were just addressing a moment ago, which was so important, why, didn't you, why did you not show more pushback from the public uh, supporting Roe v. Wade? 
it, it, it seemed that there was this enormous, um, you know, movement, you know, for, for, for life, but not, I wasn't conscious of, a, of an enormous movement supporting Roe v. Wade, and I'm curious to know why you made that choice. I, I, I'll start, and I'm sure Annie will jump in. A couple things. I mean, I think that um, these women would agree that after the Roe v. Wade decision, there wasn't, it was, it was considered a settled law. It was considered a right that was granted, and the people that we spoke to who were advocating for that, that law um, felt that their job was done, and they, they were thinking, what else? Even Dr. Boyd says, you know, I guess I'm still needed. For a long time, they didn't think they would be needed, and so there was a slow sort of realization, and one thing they say in the pro-choice movement is, like, I if you have this law, if you have um, a right, you're not really going to fight for it because you have that right. It was the people who who believed that right was wrong, that they were fighting to overturn yeah. that right. And so it really galvanized the anti-abortion pro-life movement because they didn't agree with that right. But there was, and I don't even want to use the word complacency, maybe you'd say it, but there was a sense of like, we have this right, let's get on with the rest of our rights that we want yeah. a, as, as women and as people in society. So that was, it was, a, I mean, you probably, w slower, but for us in the film, we really were looking at how the, the through this prism of the Roe v. Wade decision. And so it was very important for us to sort of understand how it became politicized in government and then in the courts before we really were focusing on, and, and so it be really became through the leg state legislatures that we were looking at the pushback. And the only thing that I would add is at one point we had a much longer cut of this film and we went a little bit more deeply into this split within the Republican Party, in particular through the voice of Tanya Mellick, who's in the film. Um, and she worked both for Governor Rockefeller and then she was a Republican delegate. And she, she articulated this battle. But what was, it, it gets a little bit down the rabbit hole because the other thing that was happening at the top of the 70s right after Roe was this thing called the Equal Rights Amendment. And it was bipartisan at the time, and there were a lot of women who were really pushing for that. It sort of died this m you know, meager death in the 80s. But that was really where Phyllis Schlafly kind of came to prominence. And it was a little bit of a deal with the devil that in 1976, before Roe became firmly enmeshed in presidential, or basically party platforms during presidential elections, there was this sort of last stand where a group of pro-choice Republican women asked the Republican Party to basically leave it off the platform, leave this issue of abortion, but then they were pressured because to do so would have alienated certain people they needed for the Equal Rights Amendment. So they made their choice in 76, and then you see in 1980 how it becomes fully part of presidential politics. But it's, you know, we didn't show the big marches when Webster was coming up, we didn't show the big march on Washington in 92, but those were huge shows of support where women came out, and it's true, but it's, to Ricky's point, we're trying to focus on the key moments that advanced the evolution of Roe. Um, Brigitte and Kitty, does the word uh, complacency actually seem like the right one to you? Yes and no. Okay, so I think that there's, especially now since uh, Trump has been elected, uh, there's huge energy among women across this nation on a whole range of issues. Um, and so uh, up until, you know, uh, 2016, I think that the complacency really focused around the electoral political process. So yes, there was huge complacency about voting on abortion or women's rights as a single issue. And our opponents did that, we did not. Uh, today I don't see any of that complacency. I see a lot of energy, uh, but that energy uh, is coming, you know, in some cases too late because if there's one more vote on the court, we're gonna have to replicate what happened in Texas 50 times or 100 times, or 150 times, because the reality is this becomes, once the court uh, overturns Roe, it becomes an issue state by state. And uh, let me just add one extra thing, which is this isn't just about abortion. Five conservative justices on the Supreme Court, including Kavanaugh or, or whoever Trump would nominate, uh, will mean a host of issues, everything we care about, lesbian and gay marriage, voting rights, racial justice, criminal justice reform, you know, every single unit of the ACLU will be busy, you know, because that's what will happen. These issues will come back to the states and we need to make sure that our complacency 
uh, is, or at least our political energy, is focused on ensuring that we have power in those states. And, and I think part of the, the complacency issue that rings true to me is that this belief that the courts will stop all of the bad things. And I think that Kitty is absolutely right that when uh, we are at the precipice of losing the right to abortion and the and the courts that won't be able to stop things anymore. I think for a long time people said, okay, we're not going to put our political energy into this because the courts will just strike it down. The lawyers will go to court and they'll get the law struck down. And the courts aren't going to save us. The courts are obviously very important, but I think that the important point in the movie and as, as Kitty is saying is that uh, it's it can't just be up to the courts. It has to be up to us and it has to be uh, it, everyone in the streets at the ballot box and uh, and this is the time. Can I, can I just add anecdotally that the case that went to the whole women's health versus Hellerstadt that went to the Supreme Court in the Fifth Circuit in Texas, um, the judge ruled that you know, wasn't really a burden to travel 200 miles because Texas has really good highways. And so, you know, it, can, it is it's a subjective flat. The road thing. is flat. Yeah. The road is it's flat. flat. It's flat, and too. Flat. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, so the faith in the courts are really going to be, it's going to be up to the subjectivity of the judges. And we have to remember that whoever is president determines who's on the courts, not only the Supreme Court, but the lower federal courts as well. Um, I want to thank you all for coming and for making this film, you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>